my screen. Oh, I should say, we've got, as I've said before, we've got a packed agenda. We've got a whole series of speakers in a whole diff a range of different subject areas. Some of the presentations are pre-recorded um, and, and they'll be played as videos. Other, uh, others are presenting live. Um, and obviously, so bear with us while we get each of the presentations up and running um, during the course of the event. There's bound to be glitches, but fingers crossed that it's not too significant. Um, and I would ask, we're on a very tight schedule. I'm already, I know I'm already aware that I'm prattling. Um, so we are on a tight schedule. So the speakers who are presenting live, Dominic will um, metaphorically, uh, not literally, tase you uh, within moments of the six minute uh, alarm uh, and you'll be dragged kicking and screaming off the, off the Zoom call. So uh, be aware that, that six minutes is the limit um, and, uh, and we'll go with that. Uh, I am going to just share a very, a few brief thoughts with you. Okay, so um, just a very quick introduction from me. Uh, this, is the, this is the area of land that we are focusing on in this project, Connecting the Coal, this wonderful project that's drawing so many people together from so many different areas of interest, uh, local residents, scientists, all in a melting pot, um, all with one common goal, which is to learn how this landscape works um, and to work out what condition it's in and to try and make it as absolutely uh, healthy and functioning and resilient as, as we possibly can over the coming uh, months and years of endeavour. Uh, we're all inv heavily invested in this project from, a, from, a, from our perspective, but also we know that many of you are, are residents and live within walking distance of this, of this river. Uh, in eastern mid Devon, and it's a, it plays a key role in your life, even if perhaps sometimes you're not not aware of it. Um, this is a, a shameless plug uh, for the Connecting the Com project website, um, but actually all the information that you're going to hear and learn about this evening is on the website. Um, and as you can see, there's a whole section of the website called Discover the Com, and that's obviously the sub the name of the event this evening. So um, I would encourage you to go to connectingthecom.com, and you can. Um, browse through uh, all sorts of different um, areas of interest, activities, events, also, uh, resources, all sorts of things that can keep you uh, merrily entertained over the coming weeks. Um, I just wanted to say something very quickly about, we took, I use the expression water resilience all the time, but actually I've become aware that not everyone knows what it, what it means. So um, really what, what we're focusing on is trying to really break, break apart the whole system and understand exactly how, how all of this, uh, how all of these processes and functions of not only the natural environment, but also the human uh, environment and our impact, impact on it and how that these different systems interact with each other. So um, what you're gonna learn about this evening is some of the work that's been done already to try and uh, look into this system to look at the natural assets, as we would call them in the landscape, to look at the functions of the, the river and, and the environment around it, but also to look at the, the human side of things. So how resilient are people in this landscape? Are there people who live at risk of flooding or drought or, or other impacts from, from the environment? So the project is a whole system approach. We're trying to look at every single aspect of, the, of this landscape. And so, of course, rivers, water, uh, they, they can play a key role in protecting us from flooding, but obviously when they're not healthy and they're not working properly, they can cause all sorts of problems for us. Um, the environment, natural environment protects us from drought. Um, it provides water for irrigation and uh, it's vital for food production, whether it's livestock or crops. And now the calm is not a drinking water catchment, but there are people who will draw water that they drink from the, the landscape. Um, but you know, I like this graphic about the dart, which is that people in Totnes are 64% dart, and that's because the water that they drink comes from the river dart. And uh, interestingly, the water that, that you drink in the river Colm probably comes largely from the river X across the, across the watershed there. We also use rivers and the water environment to, to, put, uh, to dump, I was gonna use the, the pejorative word, but we, we place our waste into rivers. They are very, it's very important they have enough water in them uh, in order to dilute the waste that we put into them. Um, they're critical, vital haven for, for wildlife. We share them with, with you know, some of the most spectacular wildlife um, uh, around. Um, and 
our soils and our landscapes and our habitats are vital um, in sequestering carbon and storing it um, for future generations. And then not, not, not least, um, rivers, the water environment, our natural landscapes are vital places for us to play their cultural heritage. Um, and we get huge, particularly in situations like we're in the coronavirus, you know, we get huge well-being and health benefits from interacting with nature. So uh, I will, so that's a very quick whistle stop tour of kind of where we're headed with this event. And so we've divided the event up this evening into each of those different categories. And you're going to hear um, about climate change, you're going to hear about flooding, drought, water quality, wildlife and heritage through the course disappeared. of the series of presentations. Okay. So I'll f I'm, we, let's go. Ready? We're ready to go. Are we, Dominic? Nod wildly if we're ready to start. Uh, yes, we are good to go. Thank you. Well done, Nick. You're pretty pretty much on time there. And I think we're going to over to you to introduce the next speaker. Yeah. Okay. So the first section um, of the of the evening is three separate talks um, on the subject of climate change, and we've asked our speakers to. Um, summarise um, their insight, their expertise into climate change in this case obviously but also how it relates to the River Colm um, specifically. So um, I'd like to invite Professor Richard Betts from the Met Office to share his screen and uh, unmute and, and, um, and give his presentation an overview of climate change. Hello, thank you, yes thanks Nick. Um, So yeah, a very short uh, uh, overview of uh, climate science uh, and what we are expecting for the future uh, on climate change. I'm, a, uh, I'm the Head of Climate Impacts Research at the Met Office Hadley Centre and also Professor at the University of Exeter. Um, so we know a lot about weather uh, and climate. We, we've been monitoring it for years and decades, in fact over a century in some cases. There's all sorts of data coming in from satellites, weather balloons, weather stations, ships, boys in the oceans and so on. So there's a lot of information on what is happening with the weather day to day and climate long term. And to understand this and to predict it for the future, both for the short term uh, for weather forecasting and the long term for climate change and for understanding past climate change, we use computer models uh, because we can't do scientific experiments with the Earth because we only have one Earth. But we have a virtual laboratory, if you like, our computer models, which represent the motion of the atmosphere, rainfall, the physics of the atmosphere, the buildup of greenhouse gases and so on in the form of mathematical equations in uh, computer code run on our giant supercomputers uh, near the Met Office uh, at Exeter. Um, and actually it's the same kind of models that we use for the weather forecast that we use for understanding past and future climate change. And in particular, the implications of the buildup of carbon dioxide and the greenhouse gases of the atmosphere, which are causing the warming of the world and changing rainfall patterns and so on. This field of science has been going for many decades. Uh, computer modeling of climate started in the 60s and this is a paper from the journal Nature published in 1972 um, by a, a, a Met Office scientist called John Sawyer who predicted using the models at the time uh, were developed by uh, many other scientists um, that the increase in CO2 by the end of the 20th century would cause a warming of about 0.6 of a degree Celsius. That was his prediction. And that was quite radical because uh, actually in the previous 20 years there's only been, there would actually been slight cooling. This graph shows that for each year from 1850 to 1972 there's a difference between the, that year's global average temperature from all these global observations I talked about and the long-term average. So you can see that since the, since the 1950s and 1960s there's been a slight cooling even though Overall, it had been slightly warmer than the, the 19th century. So the world had been cooling. Sawyer and other climate scientists predicted a warming of about 0.6 of a degree Celsius. And what happened was actually pretty close to that. Uh, the world actually warmed by about half a degree Celsius by the year 2000. So they, their prediction was uh, pretty much spot on. And the world has continued to warm since then. And now uh, we're at about one degree Celsius warmer the 19th century and this will carry on if we keep putting more 
greenhouse gases, including carbon dioxide, into the atmosphere. So here's two possible scenarios for future global warming. Um, the red bars are if we emit, continue to emit at current rates or higher, we'll see about four degrees global warming by the end of the century. But even if we rein in emissions radically now, we're committed to some further warming and we're probably going to see at least one and a half degrees global warming compared to the 19th century. So as further changes are in the pipeline, we can limit them, but we can't uh, reverse them on any, uh, any meaningful timescale. So the question is, what does this mean for, for UK weather? Uh, and in particular for Devon and, and, and the Colne Valley. Uh, so again, we can use our computer models to drill down on this into finer detail. Um, the, the most obvious thing is gonna be hotter. That's a no-brainer. Uh, we'll see more intense heat waves and longer heat waves. The other no-brainer is that uh, in the coast around Devon, we'll see uh, 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 higher sea levels. Sea levels are already rising because of melting ice, putting more water into the oceans and seawater expands, it warms as well. Uh, so events like the famous uh, collapse of the, uh, uh, the railway embankment at, uh, at Dawlish a few years ago, will be an increased risk of that kind of thing as sea levels continue to rise. But it's more complicated looking at water. And as Nick was saying, water is really crucial for the area that we're uh, considering this in this meeting. Uh, will it be wetter or will it be drier? And the answer is a bit more complicated than, than just one or the other of those. Um, overall, our, our climate models project an increase in rainfall in the winter. This is a map of one particular, the average projection uh, of winter rainfall change uh, by, by the average of the year 2061 to 2080, so the middle of the second half of this century. So in, in, the, in, in Devon, we're expecting around about uh, in the, uh, about 15 to 30 percent uh, increase in UK average rainfall in the uh, best guess, if you like, a central estimate. But we can't predict things perfectly. There's a range of possible outcomes. It could be um, less than 15 percent. It could be more than 30 percent, or maybe even over 45 percent in in South Devon, actually. Um, so a, a range of possibilities. But winter rainfall is, is expected to go up. Summer rainfall yeah, is predicted to go in the opposite direction. Generally, we'll see a drying of uh, the weather across the UK um, and in Devon, perhaps around between 20 and 40 percent decrease uh, in, in summer rainfall uh, on, in our central estimate. But again, a range of possible outcomes there. Uh, it could be less than that. It could be more. It could be uh, up to a 60 percent or even more than a 60 percent reduction in summer rainfall. So summers will be drier uh, overall, wet wetters will be winter. But it's still more complicated than that because the, uh, the even though summers are probably going to be drier overall, when it rains, it'll rain harder. Um, a warmer world means more intense rainfall. The land surface drives more intense thunderstorms, for example. So although summers overall are predicted to be drier on average, when it does rain, the rainfall will be more intense and perhaps a sort of a 30% increase in intensity of rainfall on, on, on wet days. So just to wrap up then, we are warming the world. Climate change is happening, it is our fault. This will continue to some extent, although it's up to us uh, as a global society as to how much this will uh, happen. And we can reduce the worst by raining in emissions. However, some further change is already in the pipeline. Um, in the UK and in Devon uh, and in the Colm, we're gonna expect warmer, wetter winters, hotter summers, probably drier overall. But when it does rain, it'll rain more intensely. And that's it. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Richard. Uh, that's an excellent start. I don't know how his timekeeping was, but it felt right. Um, <laughs> I'm not watching the clock myself. Um, so no, without further great. ado, just um, stop. Just Richard could stop sharing his screen. That would be. Oh, sorry. OK. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Oh. School boy era. Yeah. <laughs> um, Okay, so without further ado, we'll press on. So the second um, talk in our climate change section is from Emily Reid, who's Devon County Council's Climate Emergency Project Manager. So I'd like to, and she's going to be presenting live. So I'd like to invite Emily to um, unmute herself. Uh, come to the floor. Thank you, Nick. Ah, there you are. And um, please feel free to share your screen and, uh, and, and get started. 
Okay, great. Thank you very much. Brilliant. So hopefully you can see. Have I got? Can you see presenter view or the slideshow? We can see the slideshow. Okay. Oh, that's clever of me. Um, thank you. Um, so as Nick said, I am um, the project manager for the Devon Climate Emergency um, Partnership. Uh, and uh, we're working to create a resilient net zero carbon Devon where people and nature thrive together. So um, we're working to coordinate a, a collaborative Devon wide response to the climate emergency and ecological crisis. And the partnership declared a, a climate and ecological crisis last May. And so we're hoping to facilitate the reduction of carbon emissions to net zero by 2050 at the latest. Um, and we think that substantial nature improvement to absorb carbon will be a key part of that. And the project hopes to improve the resilience of Devon's environment against the effects of climate change. Um, so very closely aligned to the aims of connecting the coal and to prepare Devon's communities for the necessary adaptations to infrastructure and services to respond to a warmer world. Um, so um, responding to things like those drier summers and wetter um, winters that Richard just outlined. The partnership is um, 25 organisations who are, sit on a response group um, at chief executive level and um, senior officer officers and it's chaired by Devon County Council at the moment and um, many of the groups that are involved in the Connecting the Colm um, partnership are also involved in this work so there's a really helpful overlap such as uh, West Country Rivers Trust and Mid Devon and the Environment Agency as well as others. So as I said the response group is the strategic group, um, the tactical group uh, contains um, a lot of officers and other staff from the partnership to to help provide um, capacity and also to share um, learnings of, of how different organizations are developing their own plans and then there's two work streams the mitigation and adaptation stream so one reducing um, uh, we're looking at how we reduce our emissions in Devon to net zero and that's headed up by a volunteer net zero task force which are um, producing a Devon carbon plan and then there's the adaptation work stream which is headed up by the climate impact group um, led by the chaired by the environment agency at the moment um, and that's actually working regionally and will produce a Devon Cornwall and Isles of Scilly adaptation plan um, so just to highlight the work of the um, Net Zero Task Force to you, um, we, uh, we've done an evidence gathering phase where we um, asked the public for, for submissions and held um, a series of thematic hearings. Um, and we were hoping to hold a citizens assembly this, this year, but obviously the pandemic's made that tricky. So we're going ahead to consult on a draft interim Devon Carbon Plan based on all the evidence that we've gathered so far from the public and that will be out for consultation in December. So we'd love to hear um, the views of people living in the area of uh, the Colm uh, as to whether we've got it right or not. Um, Emily, you have about 30 seconds left. Okay, that's fine. And we'll do the Citizens Assembly next year and um, update the plan based on that to produce a final Devon Carbon Plan. So um, do check out our website and um, um, input into the consultation um, because a lot of the work that we're doing um, you know, is really well aligned with the Connecting the Calm. For example, we want to restore things like the Calm grassland, which is a really important carbon store. And we've already heard about um, the importance of um, managing increased rainfall with things like restoring um, the habitat around the coal um, for its water holding capacity. And so, yeah, very closely aligned with, with the work going on at Connecting the Coal. 
Fantastic. Thank you, Thank you Emily. So I shall. Yeah, please feel free to click the little red button that says stop sharing. Um, oh, I will just as soon as I <laughs> regain the full screen. Um, at the top. Mm. Um, Brilliant. Okay, Excellent. sorry about that. That's all right. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, and so now we're going to move on to the third contribution under the climate change heading. And this is uh, a video recorded by Joe Neville, who's who leads for biodiversity and ecology at West Country Rivers Trust. So this is over to me to share. He says. I'm having to guess. <laughs> Okay. Hi, my name is Jo Neville and I work for West Country Rivers Trust. Today I'm going to be taking you on a whistle-stop tour of a little piece of work that we've been doing alongside Devon County Council and Devon's local nature partnership. So this piece of work is a review of the evidence of the likely impacts that climate change is going to have on Devon's natural environment. We've been looking at some of the key risks and also some of the headline actions that we might be able to take. This work will feed into Devon's Climate Emergency Task Force, which Emily's just been talking to you about. So, as Richard's probably described earlier, climate change is likely to re result in warmer, wetter winters on average, hotter, drier summers, and also an increase in extreme events like flooding and drought. And all of these will have an impact on the habitats, the species, and the landscapes that make Devon and the calm catchment so special. So some habitats and some species are likely to be able to adapt better than others. And this is likely to result in a change in the range of some of the habitats and species and potential loss and fragmentation of others. So for instance, upland oak woods and the blanket bogs of Exmoor and Dartmoor are likely to reduce in size as the climate conditions become less suitable for them. And species like salmon and trout will probably become more susceptible to things like parasites and disease. And if we have significant drought events, that makes it really difficult for them to ma migrate upstream to their spawning grounds. On the flip side, species like the small red-eyed damselfly and the cattle egret that have recently started moving across from Europe are likely to be able to expand their ranges. So, the things like the patterns of the breeding, feeding, hibernation and migration are all likely to start to change. And this might result in things like a mismatch of the relationships between things like predators and their prey and also between pollinators and their plant species. It's also likely to result in increase of non-native species and some of these might become invasive and affect our native flora. Our habitats and species are also going to have to contend with things like a decrease in air quality, changes to soil, coastal habitats are going to have increased erosion from storm events and potential higher tides, and also freshwater are going to have to cope with things like algal blooms due to the warmer weather, and also a flush of sediments and soils from increased rainfall and sudden flooding, flash flooding events. So that gives you just a little snapshot of some of the impacts that might be coming. Obviously this is a huge topic, a lot of research being done on it at the moment. And you can kind of get lost in a rabbit hole of a bit of a doomsday scenario and wonder what on earth can we do about it. But another aspect of the project has been looking at some of the headline actions that we can take. And through this project, through other projects with West Country Rivers Trust and Connecting the Calm, it's been really, really inspiring and encouraging to see all the different ideas, the ambitions and the actions that are already being taken to address this challenge, really locally, right across Devon and then wider across the UK. I think we all agree that we're going to have to take some bold and difficult decisions 
but also that there is a role in this for everyone. There's going to need to be some big landscape scale thinking. We're going to need to restore high quality habitats and we're going to need to restore connectivity right across the different landscapes of Devon and the coral catchment. And this is where things like river corridors become really, really important. So for connecting the calm, looking at restoring some of the wetland mosaics right up at the top in the headwaters and the springline mires, and then restoring connectivity right down through the agricultural habitat and into the urban areas. So for projects like this, it's incredibly important that everyone gets involved, and that must include locals. People need to be outside, they need to be caretakers, they need to care about their environment and know about their environment. We need to have knowledge sharing between the project and also between the local people. And we need everyone to get outside, get muddy, get involved. There's going to be all sorts of talks this evening and hopefully some of those will inspire you to become involved and help out. So get outside, have fun and thanks very much for watching. Okay. Right, thanks Jo. I think Jo's on the call, so um, it's, I can say thanks to her directly. Um, and obviously, uh, if you have any questions for any of the speakers, then um, man, many of them, if not all of them, are, are joining us in the call this evening. So feel free to put your questions into the chat um, or, or raise your hand during the question and answer session that we'll have uh, in a while, um, and you can ask your, ask your questions. Um, so that, they, were, they were the three talks under the climate change section. Now, I have, we have a slight confession to make. When we asked you the poll question at the start, um, due to a, uh, a blunder, the answers that you submitted were not saved. So I'm going to be dastardly at this stage, and I'm going to ask you very kindly, if you wouldn't mind, um, just recasting your votes from uh, that previous uh, poll. Um, so you may, here we go. So uh, hope, don't, don't try and remember what you put in before and stick with that. But if you could just answer these two questions, for those of you who joined after the poll, um, question one, how aware are you of the impacts of climate change and, um, and other pressures uh, that are having or will have on the health and natural function of the River Colm? And if you scroll down, question two is how motivated are you to change your behavior and or take actions that will help improve the health and natural functions of the river column one not motivated 10 very motivated so please do um uh, if you could just click those again that'd be fantastic it's a good thing it's serendipity because some people join slightly late and that means we've we've still got the opportunity to ask them and if my colleagues could refrain from clicking the end poll that would be marvelous because that's what deleted all the answers So we're up at 80%. I think that's where we got to last time. So Dominic, if you want to close that and, and save the answers, that would be fantastic. And we can move on with the next section. Okay, well, here, here are the results. So the, the top result for question one was eight. Um, a few, quite a long few people further down in the scores um, and a few people right up at the top. Question two, um, the top answer was number 10, which is absolutely fantastic. And I think that's probably um, reflected in the number of people that have, turned, have joined us this evening during, for this event. So let's move on then. How do I get rid of, do I, do I close that? Right. Okay, so our next section is, we're gonna move on in our journey or through these different areas, these different subjects. And our second section is three short talks for, um, on the subject of flooding and obviously flooding is a critically important issue in um, the River Colm and its catchment um, and we are starting with a talk from Stephen Johnson who is the Connecting the Colm project manager so he is our he is our leader uh, in this project uh, and so I will um, play his uh, presentation now. Okay, hi everyone, I'm Stephen Johnson. I'm project manager for Connecting the Colm, and I'm gonna be talking to you today about flooding. Floodplains have always flooded. It's a natural response of rivers to rainfall in their, in their catchment. And this process 
hasn't always been negative for humans and for society. It has brought benefits in the past, including meadows like this one, and agricultural land being enriched with nutrients as a result of the river overtopping its banks uh, and spreading sediment and water out onto the floodplain. But undoubtedly, flooding now and in the past has resulted in negative and sometimes catastrophic impacts where properties and businesses are flooded and people's livelihoods and lives can be lost. Now, there are two particular types of flooding which are relevant to us here in the Calm. The first is fluvial or river flooding, and this is where water is traveling down large catchments into larger water courses. And then the level in that water course is rising up and overtopping the banks onto the adjacent floodplain. The second is about surface water flooding. And this is really important because although fluvial flooding, there's a natural floodplain which is historically flooded and we've built things there potentially that we don't want to flood and need to protect. Surface water flooding can happen in other places where not necessarily just near rivers, where intense rainfall overwhelms a localised area um, and the water can't drain away quickly enough. And now there are more properties at risk of surface water flooding than there are from river flooding. So it's a really important issue. Currently, what we have at a whole river catchment scale and in many places at a localised scale too, is dysfunctional water catchments. So it's raining and then water is rushing downstream really quickly. And this is because over time we've drained land and dug ditches and straightened channels uh, and built lots of hard, smooth surfaces for water to rush over. And this has all been for good reasons, but it does mean that water can travel much quicker. And this is resulting in a higher flow rate and a flood peak downstream. And this is what you can see in blue on this diagram. So lots of water coming and going quickly. So it's all bunched together into a peak and downstream it means we need flood walls to defend ourselves against this. So especially anything above the green line in the diagram. So what we can do by working with nature is to slightly reduce the volume of water as more will be infiltrated through soil into the ground, but it's especially to slow the flow of water. So in a flood, it'll be almost the same volume, but this volume will be spread over a much longer period of time. And the actual flow rate is lower and goes on for longer. And it means we don't need to build more hard defences downstream. And this concept is being talked about more and more, especially as people recognise the need to look at flooding in the wider context across the whole catchment and how we can work with nature. And if you see what James Bevan, the head of the Environment Agency, and George Eustace, the Environment Secretary from the government, were saying, back after the floods in February this year, this was really front and centre. So let's look at how we can achieve these aims by working with nature in the catchment of the River Pelm. So as part of this project, we're looking to have more nature-based solutions across the catchment of the River Pelm. There's three different types in particular that we're focusing on. The first is features that temporarily store more water or reconnect the river to the floodplain during flooding. So that may be features that are in or adjacent to the main river channel and the floodplain, but it may also be up in the landscape as well, as we talked about earlier, surface water flooding and how water is flowing down the catchment is very important. And we want to look at the whole catchment uh, and take a catchment approach. The second is all about soil restoration, and you'll be hearing more from Yog about this in a few minutes. Um, soils are really fundamental for how the catchment responds to, to rainfall. The third is about floodplain hedges and riparian planting, so planting, wood, planting trees and woodland um, adjacent to the watercourse. So we are interested in tree planting in a wider area, but we're particularly interested adjacent to the watercourse because it will increase friction uh, and slow and store more water uh, as it travels down the catchment. So as part of this project, we've built a computer model of the whole catchment to look at the features that were just described uh, and also to simulate how the catchment is responding to different rainfall events looking back into the past so looking at recent big flood events like this one you can see here in heel in november 2012 looking at other potential rainfall events that could happen now or into the future as well with different climate change scenarios and what we're also trying to model is what the potential benefits of different nature-based solutions are so especially for reducing flooding as we just described but also trying to use the model intelligently um, and to quantify and understand the impacts and, and benefits of doing more of this type of work, um, partly for flooding, but also for where we get other benefits, like for reducing risk of drought and getting benefits for wildlife and water quality too. And we're trying to use this model in the future for building the case for more investment in these measures. 
and hopefully a more resilient catchment as a result. So what we want to do next is to take the model that we have and then zoom down from the whole 100 square mile catchment into local areas and work with you, communities, landowners, uh, capture your local knowledge and your perspective on what you think the opportunities are. So we're really keen to do this um, over, the over the course of the next few months and if you would like to do this for your area please get in touch. We'll also be looking to fund uh, and install and monitor nature-based solutions demonstrations. So if you're already keen to do that then please get in touch with us. If you haven't already you can also sign up for the mailing list uh, at the website and there's also a link to our online map-based survey where you can tell us about how you access the river, um, what you think about the issues and where you've seen problems like water pollution and surface water flooding and also where you think the opportunities are too. Thanks very much. Fantastic. Um, I was just going to say the, um, the those links um, that Stephen showed at the end of his presentation would be very useful. Perhaps um, Stephen, if you posted them in the chat, then people could click through and have a quick look at the website, may maybe during or after the event, but also um, to have to have a look at the Mapsionaire, the questionnaire, um, which is quite fun to fill in. So uh, that would be really, really good. So without further ado, and yes, I can see some questions coming into the chat, which is great. So please keep those uh, coming. I've already seen one question. Is this where beavers come in? I'm sure we'll come on to that in due course because we've got um, Ed Parferis from Devon Wildlife Trust later talking about beavers uh, in Devon particular, uh, specifically. So uh, hope we'll keep our powder dry on that one. Um, so next we uh, have a talk from uh, Rosie Lane who is who works for the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydro Hydrology doing research on flooding. Uh, and so I will now he says optimistically. Here we go. Let's have a go at this. Hmm. Where is it? I'm Rosie Lane and I'm interested in how climate change might affect river flows for flooding in the future. And today I'm going to talk about work that I did as part of my PhD at the University of Bristol and that I'm continuing to work on at the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology. So as we've heard in previous presentations, the UK climate is changing. The newest UK climate projections produced by the Met Office indicate that there's an increased chance of warmer, wetter winters and hotter, drier summers, and that there'll be an increase in the frequency and intensity of extreme events. Here I show a plot produced from the UK climate projections, which shows the percentage change in heavy rainfall from 12 different climate models. Green areas show an increase in the intensity of heavy rainfall in the future. We can see here that most of the climate models agree that heavy rainfall is likely to become more intense um, across many areas in Great Britain. It's really important that we understand what impact these climate changes will have on river flows so that we can plan for future changes, for example, when building flood infrastructure. The increase in heavy rainfall and wetter winters may make flooding seem more likely, but at the same time, a hotter and drier climate overall may lead to reduced river flows. In order to understand the relationship between changes in climate and changes in river flow, we can use a river flow model. For my PhD, I used 12 climate scenarios from the Met Office UK climate projections with a river flow model which was set up across Great Britain. No model is a perfect representation of the real world, and we find that quite often different model setups can seem to produce good simulations but when we look at the future, they all produce slightly different projections. To account for this uncertainty in predicting future river flow, I have used 12 different climate model simulations from the UK climate projections and 30 different river 
of my model setups to each climate scenario. So in total, I had 360 possible future river flow scenarios. Here I show results from just three of those 360 scenarios. These plots show the change in annual maximum flow, which is the highest flow in any given year. And I use this to indicate future river flooding. Areas coloured in blue are areas where simulated river high flows increase in the future, so we may see increased future river flooding. This plot on the left is one of the worst case scenarios for Great Britain from the total of 360 simulations. Here, high flows are likely to increase across most of Great Britain. Some of these increases are large. For example, here in the south of Wales, annual maximum flows increase by 60%. This centre plot is one of the middle or average scenarios from the 360 simulations. Here, high flows only increase along the west of Great Britain. And this plot on the right is one of the better case scenarios, with only small increases in river flows along the west coast and in Scotland. So overall, these plots show that there are many uncertainties in predicting future river flows. But despite this, there are some areas where all models agree. Increases in future flood flows are possible across most of Great Britain, but our results suggest increases in floods are most likely for catchments along the west coast. Ongoing research is looking into how different aspects of river flows may change in the future, and we're applying different river flow models. Thank you for listening to this presentation. Okay, excellent. Um, I was just, sorry, I was just, uh, I was just, I was struck down by that because I was actually just watching the watching the presentation. I hadn't actually seen that presentation before, so I was just having watched it. I was just, my brain was full of all sorts of questions that I wanted to ask, but then I thought, oh, hang on, I can't ask questions because I'm supposed to be running this running this event. Uh, so uh, um, good to see that there are good questions coming in in the chat, though. Uh, so that's encouraging. Um, now I'm going to we, we move on to a presentation from someone who I would describe as Mr. Soils, uh, a, a legend of soils and farm advice, um, Jog Watkins, who is a colleague of mine at West Country Rivers Trust. He's going to talk about soils, but in particular in, in the, the critical role that soils play um, in regulating the flow of water across the landscape. I've given him the big build up now, so we'll have to see see how it goes. Hello everyone, my name is Yorworth Watkins, but more commonly I'm known as Yog and I work for the West Country Rivers Trust. I'd like to take this opportunity to talk about soils and how important they are. Unless you work in the environmental or farming sectors, it may have passed you by just how important our soils are. Beneath our feet, this ubiquitous natural resource with its wide variety of types such as clay, sandy, silty, peaty, chalky and loamy, is very often ignored. Changes in weather patterns and the havoc that major natural events can wreak have meant that the government are now keen to slow the flow of water through river catchments to reduce the floods, reduce droughts and to try and control water pollution. And that is where soils come in. Essentially, the way we manage our landscape can affect the way that rainwater reaches the wider river system. Well-structured soils with plenty of air spaces mean that rainwater will reach our rivers cleaner and more slowly. Crucially, healthy soils also benefit the farmer as they hold on to the moisture and nutrients needed to grow crops, improve yields and the increasing the windows of opportunity for cultivations and grazing at either end of the growing season. However, sadly, around 40% of our soils are sufficiently degraded to induce enhanced surface water runoff within the landscape, as well as limiting food production. Alongside these problems, our river habitats and the wildlife they contain are also adversely affected. To solve these problems and increase the health of our soils, it is vital to gain an understanding of the broad types of soils that we are likely to encounter and their characteristics. Soils are made up of the underlying minerals 
sand, silt and clay and broken down biological material interdispersed with pores that can hold the water in the air. However, it is the proportion of these constituents that determines how a soil functions in the landscape. Within the calm watershed, there is a diverse range of soils that all have their inherent capabilities and water holding capacities. These range from the low organic matter free draining brown earth soils in the lower calm, for example in the Kentisby area, to medium organic matter seasonally waterlogged clay cap soils on the East Devon Plateau, and some highly organic matter peaty soils around the spring line of the upper catchment. Clay based soils can be productive and have medium levels of organic matter. These soils can have a low rainfall acceptance potential as they often sit above slowly permeable clay subsoils, which can generate rapid runoff if the soils become naturally saturated or have been damaged. Clay soils can hold their moisture for long periods, which can also make them susceptible to damage, but they are more structurally stable than lighter soils and have, greater, and have a greater drought tolerance. Light sandy soils are naturally well aerated, meaning these soils are able to break down plant remains much quicker than other soils. Hence, they have an inherently low organic matter level. These free draining soils have a high rainfall acceptance, and if the soils are well structured, are, likely, are unlikely to become waterlogged even in winter. However, the light nature of these soils does mean that they are unable to retain water and are susceptible to drought. If they become damaged or lie exposed to rainfall, the lack of organic matter does make these soils more vulnerable to surface capping, which can lead to excess runoff and water and wind erosion. Peaty soils can hold large volumes of water, but once saturated, mostly during the winter, excess rainfall will naturally run off into the wider river system, and this can help contribute to some flooding. If we get our soils right, it is a huge benefit for both people and wildlife. The Connecting the Calm project is hoping to reconnect people to their soils and encourage them to learn just how multifaceted and valuable soils are to our society. What will you do? Excellent. Never disappoints. Um, <laughs> I like that. The Connecting the Calm, he said the Connecting the Calm project is trying to reconnect people with their soils. There's a, there's a, there's a, a militant group of soil uh, people, people who are interested in soils, and I love the idea of reconnect. And, uh, historically, um, there was a very strong cultural connection between communities and their, and their soil, and, and in some areas we've lost that. Um, and Yog is a firm believer that we need to recreate that, that, that cultural um, and physical connection with, with our soils. So that's a very good take home uh, there. Now I'm aware that there are again lots of questions coming in. We've, we've got another. We do have a Q and A after the next next three talks. So please remember your questions, um, and we'll invite people to put their hands up. I know that there have been some hands going up, um, but please please don't uh, give up. We we will come to you uh, so that, and ask people to ask their questions. So and um, so we'll have a Q a Q and A in a short while. Um, but before uh, we do that, we have another. We're moving on to another section, um, another topic. Um, so we've covered climate change, uh, we've, we've looked at flooding, uh, and now we're gonna look at the other side of that coin, which is drought. Um, and uh, not much is, a lot of, there's a lot of talk in, in the media and around about flooding, um, but a lot less um, talk about, about drought. Uh, and as Richard's talk on climate change showed, uh, when flood, increased flooding is not the only potential impact of, of climate change, um, increased risk of and severity of drought is, is another one. So we're going to go into another series of uh, three talks here, he says optimistically. Bear with me as I get my bearings. Yes, so the first talk of the three is by um, Dr. Sarah Ward, uh, who uh, has recently joined West Country Rivers Trust, I'm pleased to say, uh, and she's going to give us an overview of drought. Uh, and then uh, Freya and Gavin will give us a bit more detail in some and more specific information after that. So without further ado, I will...
Hello everyone, I'm Dr Sarah Ward from the West Country Rivers Trust. I'm going to introduce the topic of droughts, briefly covering what they are and what they might mean for communities and ecosystems in the context of climate change. Drought is a slow onset hazard. Effects accumulate slowly over substantial periods, usually without a clearly defined beginning and ending. Droughts are usually described as a long period with no rain or unusually low levels of rain or other precipitation. Weather and climate are different in different places throughout the world, so there's no single definition of what counts as a drought. This complexity has resulted in substantial consideration of droughts from different perspectives, resulting in four types of drought. Meteorological drought is defined as precipitation deficiency over a given period. Hydrological drought, often monitored by water companies, is defined as a deficiency of surface and subsurface water supplies compared to average conditions. Agricultural drought is defined as insufficient support for plant water demands. And socioeconomic drought is defined by there are societal or environment, environmental impacts that have consequences to communities, both communities of people and other organisms. Socioeconomic drought emphasises the relationship it's between animated, water and human not. activities. It's manifest due to the overlapping of all the drought perspectives. Natural drivers and human activities combine to catalyse new or aggravate existing drought conditions. Three characteristics are important in drought monitoring. Severity or intensity, which is the deficit in rainfall usually measured in millimetres per month. Duration, which is the length of time the deficit occurs in days or months and spatial coverage, which is the geographical area experiencing the deficit. Geology is also a very important influencing factor as it determines whether surface waters or groundwaters or both suffer from the deficit. Severity is as, a, as important as the duration to characterise a drought and knowing drought severity helps in taking appropriate drought risk management measures, which are becoming increasingly important as climate change affects drought frequency. Droughts are projected to increase in frequency and severity over the coming decades in the UK as a result of climate change. UK climate change projections show a general trend of increasingly wet winters and drier summers with overall warmer temperatures in all seasons. River and lake water quality are projected to, to decline because of higher water temperatures, lower river flows and increased algal blooms in summer months. In addition, the UK Committee on Climate Change Risk Assessment identified water shortages as one of six urgent priority climate risks requiring more action. Demand for water could be more than 150% of the available resource in many UK catchments by the 2050s under some climate change scenarios. Under these scenarios it will be not possible to abstract water up to 25% of the time without causing ecological damage in many catchments. Interventions might include restrictions on use such as hose pipe bans. In addition, the average number of hot days per year and the chance of a severe heat wave are increasing and projected to rise further with climate change. Consequently, heat wave events like those experienced in 2003 and 2018 are projected to increase in the UK by the 2040s. Ensuring there is enough water for people and the environment during a dry period or drought is thus vital to reduce the risk of negative consequences and even conflict over water. Negative consequences of changing water quantity and water quality will be felt by a range of dependent ecosystems and species, which includes us. For example, our water and food supplies, power generation, navigation, recreation, tourism and health. Good news is action to address these challenges is already happening globally, nationally, regionally and locally, and that's where you come in. The following presentations will give greater insight into what's going on to mitigate and adapt to drought near and in the comb catchment. And later on we'll be briefly exploring how you can help us increase this positive action for further positive outcomes. Thank you. Excellent, that's a great introduction. Um, I am um, being chivied a bit on time. Um, my timekeeping is famously rubbish. Um, so I'm going to keep the me talking bits shorter and we'll and we'll keep going because we want to have some time for Q&A. So um, without further ado, I'll queue up the next presentation, which is from Freya Stacey, who's also from West Country Rivers Trust, 
and she works on the Pro Water Project, which is focused specifically on water resources um, and in particular uh, drought. So he said, I'm going to be quicker, and then he's not. Hello, my name is Freya Stacey. I work for WRT as an evidence and engagement officer, and I'm going to talk to you about the Interreg Pro Water Project. Pro Water is a European funded partnership project aiming to address the impacts of climate change and enhance the availability of raw water for people and the environment through ecosystem based adaptations. Nature based solutions are measures that enable the natural environment to provide solutions to human problems. Ecosystem-based adaptations are nature-based solutions designed specifically to build resilience to climate change. We are working to fill the information gap to policy and the general public about the need for long-term drought risk strategies that involve catchment management. Current climate trends and projections predict that in the coming years, Northern Europe will experience changes in seasonal weather with increasing temperatures and winter precipitation and an increase in the probability of high temperature extremes droughts and extreme rainfall events leading to flooding. Between 1976 and 2006, droughts alone accounted for 100 billion euros of economic impact in the EU. In addition to changing weather, population growth and increasing water consumption will put further pressure on water supplies. Analysis by the World Resource Institute shows that many areas in Northern Europe are already under water stress and without action, the situation will only get worse. The predicted impacts of climate change are likely to exacerbate seasonal variations in water availability, leading to erratic and uncertain water supplies, often coinciding with peaks in demand from human and environmental needs. Changing rainfall patterns alongside intensification of agriculture and urbanisation impact water quality as well as water quantity. The effects of poor water quality are amplified during periods of low water levels as there is less dilution of contaminants, increasing the costs of water treatment and the risk posed to aquatic species. Increasing the resilience of catchments to all these pressures requires many different actors to work together in a holistic manner that provides multiple societal and environmental benefits. Strategic water reservoirs and aquifers allow us to bridge droughts or periods of water scarcity. But over time, the replenishment of these strategic water reserves has become insufficient because landscapes have been adapted for the well-being and needs of generations of people. They have been subjected to land use changes, soil sealing, drainage and groundwater abstraction. These pressures have a major impact on the hydrological system, characterised by water moving faster through the catchment with more frequent floods, declining groundwater levels and a decrease in the natural water retention. These changes have also had an impact on river hydrology, soil nutrient retention, soil carbon sequestration and biodiversity. A range of ecosystem based adaptations can be used to enhance water security. Pro Water focuses on supporting water retention and infiltration capacity of the landscape. These measures can be investments in green infrastructure, for example, forest conversion, tree planting and wetland creation while others can be improved management practices, such as agriculture that reduces and remediates soil compaction. If we're committed to a future with clean and plentiful water for all, we need to fund schemes that promote a system where the landscape stores, cleans and delivers good quality water for us. Funding measures that can achieve this will provide a steady supply of clean water for use by both people and the environment. In some situations, ecosystem-based adaptations alone will not be enough to provide a comprehensive solution, but when considered alongside traditional water management, it is often more cost-effective and can deliver benefits that go beyond water security, including biodiversity and climate change resilience. This approach involves spatially targeting specific measures in the landscape determined by the existing natural capital, topography, geology, soils, habitats, etc quantifying what benefits these measures would provide in that location to support the development of a financing scheme to pay for the provision and management of the measures. This leads to a resilient water supply for humans and the environment, mitigating the effects of droughts and reducing flood risks. 
Rainwater hopes that ecosystem-based adaptations will be considered as a crucial component of sustainable water management and climate change adaptation, alongside other approaches such as demand management, regional water transfers and a reduction in leakage, whilst also providing the multiple benefits through additional ecosystem services. Thank you. Fantastic. OK, without further ado, I'll introduce the final speaker from the drought and water resources section. Um, this is an, a live one. Um, so uh, I'd like to invite Gavin Saunders uh, from the Blackdown Hills Facilitation Group to um, reveal himself, not literally, uh, and um, unmute himself and share his presentation. Are you there, Gavin? I'm here, Nick. Thanks very much. Um, hopefully, can you tell me if you can see a pretty orchid on the screen there? Butterfly orchid. I can't tell whether it's lesser or greater. Yes, yeah, that come through to you? Oh, it's not a test, don't worry. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks very much and thanks for the uh, invitation to, to, to talk this evening. Um, those of us who live in the Blackdowns um, know that they are frequently muddy and wet. Um, but uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, an area where they are frequently muddy and wet, which is also uh, which also harbours some real exotica in terms of for wildlife is also um, very good in helping us fight um, the impacts of climate change. In this case, in the context of retaining water in the hills, slowing the flow and helping us in times of, of drought. So I'm going to talk to you about Springline Myers. Um, if you were to cut a, a big slice out of one of the valleys uh, towards the head of, of the calm up into the, in the Black Downs, like a big slice of, of, uh, of cake, uh, and look at the layers, the, the, the rocky layers that you would see, this is kind of a, a simplified uh, uh, cross-section of what that would look like. So um, we have a, a layer of clay with flints on the top, uh, we have uh, a layer of upper green sand, which is a porous sandy rock beneath that. And then we have a layer of, of clay, clay rocks, lias clays below that. Now, when the rain falls on the tops of the hills, it percolates down through the upper green sand. But where it meets the Im impermeable clays, it has to find its way out uh, to the surface. And where it finds its way out, it creates a spring and we get a series of those springs in what we call the spring line all the way around uh, the, the hills in the in the tops of the valleys there at a remarkably consistent altitude so it's like a sort of plimsoll line that runs all the way around the edges of, of, of the valley heads there and in places along that spring line there are examples of what we call springline mire, which is a particular type of habitat that is associated with those permanently wet conditions. Now, some of those uh, um, springline mires you can access uh, and uh, make sure you take your wellies when you go. But for example, there's Ashcom Turbury, which is a Demola Trust nature reserve just up above Hemiok. There is Brimley Mire, which is a Somerset Wildlife Trust nature reserve over near Church Stanton. Um, Blackdown Common um, above Calmstock, parts of that is Springline Mire and that is open access uh, land uh, with uh, big footpaths through it. And Southey and Gotley Moor uh, up near Smeetharp at the path through it. All of those are very good places to go and see what Springline Mire actually looks like in practice. So what happens at that spring line is that the water that seeps out from the porous rock above um, gradually creates uh, vegetation and peaty soils around it at those seepages. And as those peaty soils develop, they gradually slow the flow of the spring water is. We've created this spring line vegetation which holds water within itself like a huge sponge. 
That sponge happens to be extremely uh, varied and rich in the wildlife that it supports. So um, many orchids, uh, like uh, marsh spotted orchids on the left there, um, exotic things like bog asphodel, the yellow plant on the, on the right there, and the nodding heads of um, uh, cotton grass, bog cotton grass in the middle. And if you go down and look really, 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 really closely, you'll find some real exotic things down there. The, the pink little flower that it, there is a beautiful thing called bog pimpernel. And the rather alien looking uh, thing next to it is a thing called sundew, which is an ins insectivorous plant, which actually catches insects on the sticky hairs on its leaves and absorbs them rather gruesomely uh, to supp supplement its diet because the poor acid soils don't provide it with much nutrients. So there's some pretty raw life and lifestyles going on amongst these spring lion myers. Gavin, you've got a they are extraordinarily rich in invertebrates. Uh, Gavin, you've got 30, 30 seconds left. Okay, thanks. Amongst the most exotic and obviously the insects are the butterflies, of course. And though we've lost a lot, lost a lot of our most uh, rare butterflies in the Black Downs Hills, we do have a strong population of this one still. In some places, the small pearl bordered fritillary. So to summarise, spring lion myers, they're sponges. They help to slow the flow of water coming, uh, coming from, from rainwater through the, the ground above. They retain water in times of drought. And um, most importantly, um, they support, from my point of view as an ecologist, they support hugely vulnerable wildlife. But they are extremely vulnerable. Um, most have been lost to drainage and agricultural improvement over the last 50, 60 years and the ones that are left serve only a small proportion of the potential value that they could serve in the future in retaining water in our landscape. Thanks very much. Right, good, excellent. Thank you so much for that. Um, Great. So what, what we have now is we have a, a, a short moment to um, do a bit of Q&A. So um, we are a little bit behind time, but nothing too drastic. Um, I think everyone, hopefully everyone is comfortable uh, and finding the content interesting. Um, but yeah, so um, uh, colleagues are watching the, the Q&A and the, and the chat. Is, are, there, are there any questions that we want to to put to any of the speakers um, right now. Obviously, you're very welcome to raise your hand. If you, if you click on the participants button at the bottom of your screen, then there is a, should be a function for you to raise your hand. So um, for the next five minutes or five or so minutes, we could have a quick Q and A. Would... We have a question from Councillor John Berry that would be, that's an interesting one to take about dredging. Yes, th th thank you and good afternoon all. Um, yeah, I've been listened interestingly to what has been said re or the subjects that have been presented. Um, my concern is that it has been four years since the Environment Agency took over drainage concerns because when it was southwest water looking after the rivers, um, the river I'm talking about is the calm between uh, below Callumton and above Heel where my late uncle used to farm, and it was dredged regularly. Um, perhaps this is showing my age, but I can well remember the benefits that this had. Now all we have is a river that is fully silted. It doesn't take hardly any flood water. What does happen is by the bridge um, with, below the Merry Harriers pub, which is below Callumton, if you go towards Bradnich, you cross the bridge, the motorway and the River Calm Bridge. It is so full, soon as we get any, a lot of rain, it just spreads over a massive area. Now this didn't happen years ago. Yes, it flooded, but it's such a wide area and it's like a drain pipe. If a drain pipe is half full, it can't take the amount of water. So the Environment Agency is basically against dredging because it will spoil and kill all the little amphibians and everything, little water evils, etc., etc., which I really don't agree with. It, it will perhaps some, but they, they regenerate and come back. 
and all the soil you put on the sides of the field is good fully enriched soil so my concern is why can't we dredge rivers where there's a need thank you thanks thanks john um i suppose um i'll take that one because it's uh quite relevant to to flooding um i um I think that part of the argument for not dredging is that it's really dealing with the symptom rather than the cause of the problem. So as Jörg mentioned in his talk, it's really important to look at soils across the catchment um, and trying to ensure they're healthy and staying where they want to be, not ending up downstream in rivers. So yes, you're right. The soils, if you, took, took, if you dredge it downstream, you've got lovely nutrient and rich soil and sediment. To spread on your field there but ideally we want that to stay on fields upstream um, rather than ending up in the river in the first place um, so i think this project um, isn't gonna you know we don't have a, a specific policy on dredging or not dredging um, i think what you're saying about the river channel not having capacity and then overtopping and accessing the floodplain that's actually we want it to do that in places where it's not causing Big problems because in flood events we've got too much flow it's causing problems in downstream where we are experiencing flooding um, in places we don't want to flood so we do need it to we need the water to be somewhere um, and slowing it down in the catchment in places where it's okay and it's not causing major issues to flood is is what is what we want to see but we need to do that intelligently so we need to have clear channels where we want to move it along, but ultimately we do want to slow the flow um, as the water moves down the catchment in, in places where it's appropriate to do so. Um, yeah, I don't know if anyone has anything that they would like to add, um, but John, I think you've, we talked about this previously and I think I, yeah, I mentioned possibly was before uh, the days of COVID. So we were, we were gonna go and have a look at this area that you were, you were talking about. So, um, yeah, we can we can do that. I'm happy to do that uh, following COVID guidelines um, in the coming months if we're if we're able to. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I am unsure. I think probably uh, there are so many questions that are coming up. Hopefully, I think the best way at this we're going to have another Q and A at the end. Um, I think probably the best thing to do at the moment is to move, press on with the with the with the sections of the evening. Uh, we don't des we're desperately keen not to keep anyone hanging on too long after the end of the of the um, event. Um, do, what do what do people um, what do colleagues think of that suggestion? Press on and wait for the Q and A at the end, or do we want to do another question now? Should we just just maybe have one more from Lucy Mottram has her. Hand yeah, I saw that. Yeah, okay. Let's go with that, Lucy. Do you, do you want to ask your question? And any others, please put them in the in the chat, and we'll come to them at the end. I'm afraid I'm, I've, I've hijacked my wife's. Oh. Um, <laughs> I'm going to um, rephrase John Berry's question, really, and as uh, to so the catchment management, and and ask the question as interested people to improve the catchment management so that flooding at a particular pinch is less of a problem. Because the soon thing, you, we, we, it, we all mix between biodivision and practicalities of, of day to day nature. But I, I think that the real reason why we're seeing these problems is yes, the events are becoming more severe, but the, the real response to that should be um, um, improved management of the catchment so have that fast response to, to flooding events. So I, I think really how can we encourage um, better land use so that we don't have these problems <laughs> I'm, Thank you. I'm, 
thanks um lucy's husband um i'm so, uh, i'm sorry i don't know if it's my connection <laughs> i don't know if it was my connection or yours but i didn't catch very much of that apart from i think what you were saying was that it's that we have problems with land use cause be, being being a major part of the problem and how do we address that but i i, I don't, it might be helpful if you can if you can write it in the chat um and we can come to it at the end because i think um, I think actually this is the perfect this is the perfect question because actually uh, I having having seen the next three talks already that we're going to get um, that I'm about to in, introduce hopefully some of the that question will be answered and beyond that I mean the most important thing to say is that connecting the com has land management improved land management at the absolute core of what we're trying to do because we recognise that it is such a critical factor in in underpins all of these um, different uh, services ecosystem services as we would call them but um, you know the benefits that we get from from nature so um, hope, hopefully the next talk or two will, will help uh, answer that question so without further ado then um, I'll we'll, we'll move on so we've got three more sections uh, three talks three talks and then two and the sec these sections are again, also really interesting so we've got a section on water quality a section on wildlife and a section on heritage uh, and connecting the column has been looking at each of those in great detail so um, the first talk in water quality is from Hugh Davey from the Environment Agency who's going to give an overview uh, on the subject of water quality so I will put that on the screen enjoy Hello, I'm Hugh Davey from the Environment Agency, and I've been asked to give a brief overview of water quality in the Colm catchment. Whilst we all probably understand the importance of water quality for a healthy landscape, unless we have a particular personal or professional interest, we might not understand the state of our rivers or what's driving their condition. Um, in this brief presentation, I'm going to run through how we measure water quality and talk a little about water quality in the Colm and finish with a forward look. So, measuring water quality. We use a piece of legislation called the Water Framework Directive, within which there are a series of ecological and chemical parameters to determine the state of a river. These include biological elements like fish and invertebrates, and physico-chemical elements like ammonia, phosphate and dissolved oxygen. Based on sampling and analysis, we can assign the river a classification from high to bad, as detailed in the box on the bottom right of the slide. If a river is classed as moderate, poor or bad, it means it's failing to meet the required standards. From our sampling and analysis, we're also able to determine why a water body is not meeting the required standards. So the cold catchment. This map shows the rivers in the Colm catchment. They're color coded as per their water framework directive classification. Again, as detailed in the box on the bottom right. As discussed in the previous slide, any river class as being below good is deemed to be failing. So anything on this map that is not colored blue or green is failing to meet the required standard. As you can see, sadly, in the Colm catchment, all of our rivers are failing to meet the required standard. On the map, next to the river's name, there is a bit of detail around the failing elements for that water body. If we look at the upper Colm as an example, so the top right water body, we can see a capital P, which is shorthand for phosphate, phytobenthos and macrophytes, which are types of aquatic plants, and fish. These failures are a similar story for all of the rivers in the Colm catchment, and it indicates a problem with nutrient enrichment of the river. So too many nutrients getting into the water and impacting upon the aquatic ecosystem. Through analysis, we're able to determine what's driving these issues. For the Colm catchment, the dominant influence on water quality is agriculture. This is often runoff from fields, which could be the result of poor soil condition, or high risk, high intensity land use. Sometimes when we talk about water quality, it can feel a little abstract. 
especially when we start talking about physical chemical elements and analysis. But often in the calm and other catchments, poor water quality can be incredibly apparent, as these videos show. But it's important to remember that apart from the intrinsic value of water quality, we need to recognize what good water quality enables. This includes a richer biodiversity, us able to use the river and its environment for recreation, and even abstraction for industry or farming. So briefly then, a forward look. We know current water quality problems are likely to be exacerbated as a result of climate change. More extreme flooding and drought both have the potential to amplify the impacts of water quality. We also know that the industry with the biggest current influence on water quality in the coal, agriculture, is facing significant change as we move through Brexit and will need to operate in increasingly challenging weather patterns. We know too that the catchment will have to accommodate significant growth through the Colm Garden Village and it's essential that such developments look to improve water quality. So this is the last slide from me and it's one I've stolen from Stephen, the Connecting the Colm project manager. What we have here is a row, a blue row at the top of problems we are aware of in the catchment or challenges in the catchment some solutions which we could use to address those problems and the benefits if we are able to address those problems. Really in this brief presentation today, I've focused on that blue road, the current challenges and problems. But through this project with your input, we can start to define that second row of solutions so that we can then all realize the benefits, the pinky purple row at the end. Thanks for your time today and apologies that this was a recorded presentation. No, no apology required, Hugh. Um, it's, the, it's, the be it's the best way of getting it done securely, given the limitations of various internet connections. Um, so what Hugh highlighted there was the importance of monitoring. Um, and now we're going to move on to a talk from Simon Browning from West Country Rivers Trust, who's going to talk about citizen science, because citizens, um, people like yourselves, can play a critical role in helping um, the Environment Agency and others to monitor the health of our rivers. Hello, my name is Simon Browning. I work for West Country Rivers Trust, leading the volunteer monitoring scheme there for West Country CSI, that stands for Citizen Science Investigations. It's a scheme we developed about five years ago to really help people and local communities monitor their own rivers and streams and uh, it provides a quick snapshot of lots of things, lots of different elements about the river um, that are really useful for helping us understand the health of the local uh, water body. It's based around a survey form, so there's just two sides of the form uh, which you fill out in the field. It takes about 10 or 15 minutes each site and there's four main parts of the survey form. So the first one is the uh, survey details, so where you are, uh, the time, date, the size of the, the type of river body, whether it's a stream or, or pond or whatever. Um, that's really important. Then the second part is what we call ecosystem observation. So this is around the habitat and the land use. Um, it also includes things about anything, any wildlife you might spot or invasive plants and bankside vegetation, that kind of thing. And there's a section on pollution. Uh, sources of pollution, these can be things like sewage treatment overflows, uh, it might be something like cattle in the river or soil runoff, all those kind of things are listed. It's also a place where you can log things like um, litter, fly tipping, uh, so that's the pollution section. Then there's a section on the river channel itself. So this is, gives you a chance to say how wide and deep it is, what the substrate, the, what the bottom's made of, and also that's where you record some more quality information. So as part of the scheme, we provide you with a water quality monitoring kit that consists of a, a total dissolved solids probe, uh, which also measures temperature. So this is just a, a small probe you put in the river or in your sample bucket. Um, it measures the electrical conductivity, basically, of the water sample. So when water falls from the sky as rain, it doesn't conduct electricity at all. It's, it's completely pure. As it picks up pollution and runoff, then that conductivity will start to rise. And this will measure that and convert that to a score for total dissolved solids. So that's a really useful general indication of pollution. Um, then there's this, which is a turbidity tube. So it's a, it's a, it's a plastic tube with a disc at the bottom and a, a number up the side, numbers up the side. 
Um, you fill it with sample, and as you do so, you look down the tube and see when that disc disappears, and then you can read off the number on the side, and that gives you a score for its ability. So that's a good uh, measure of the optical clarity of the water. And then finally, we've got a phosphate test kit. So this, you have a strips in here, and they, you put them in the test tube, and um, when there's phosphate in the sample, the sample will go blue. So then at the end, after a couple of minutes, you can uh, compare the color in your tube to what you see on here, and that will give you the phosphate reading. So that's important because phosphate comes from um, sewage treatment works, often from farmland or from domestic sources, and can cause um, overgrowth, if you like, of algae and things in the, in the water column, in the river. So all that data then, you fill it out in the field on your paper form, and then go on to our website where you can enter into a digital version of the form, and that's when it arrives in our online interactive map. So this is all the points across the West Country. If you zoom into the, um, if we zoom into the column here, we can see we've got a point near Columpton. And so we can go down here and look at all the different aspects. So the wildlife that's been recorded nearby, um, the temperature of the water, and of course, things like turbidity and phosphates. We've developed a traffic light system here, so to give you an indication of what's good and what isn't. So blue and green is at the good end, and then through yellow and orange to red is at the higher end. Another nice feature, which is important for us to understand how to put the results in context, is the ability to record photographs. So ideally, we'd, go out, we'd ask you to go and survey these points every month, and then that gives us a really nice picture of what's going on over time. So that's a bit about the system. If you'd like to help us, just stop doing that. If you'd like to help us get involved with monitoring your local river, then get in touch via the website or by emailing us, and uh, we'll get you set up. Thanks a lot. Excellent. So, um, so that's everything. That's the quick insight into the citizen science uh, program and. As part of Connecting the Colm, we are looking to roll out um, training uh, and recruitment of citizen scientists across the Colm catchment. So um, I'll just repeat what Simon said, which is, um, yeah, please do um, get in touch. And I wonder if, Simon, if you're there, if you could post the link to the, to the sign-up page uh, in, the, in the chat, that, then people can, can connect through straight away and sign up uh, fe feverishly. Um, so the third and final talk in the water quality section is from Richard Horrocks. Um, he's a member of the Colm Fly Fishing Club and is also the coordinator of something called Riverfly, which is another volunteer monitoring uh, scheme. Uh, and he's got a presentation about that. So um, I will put that on the screen. Hello, I'm Richard Horrocks, and this is my presentation on Riverfly. You'll see that I'm a member of the Culm Fly Fishing Club, and it's through fishing the river that I became involved with Riverfly, and more recently, the CSI. There's been a fishing club between Comstock and Hemioc for well over 100 years, and the River Culm was outstanding for its brown trout. At least two fishing flies, the pheasant tail and the beacon beige, named after Comstock Beacon, were first used on this river and are now found across the world. About 10 years ago, I was asked if I wanted to be involved with Riverfly to carry out regular surveys of invertebrates that live in our rivers. These tell us how numerous and diverse the species are. So why does that matter? Fish need a plentiful varied diet and clean water. Without these, their numbers decrease, they don't grow, and they may even disappear. So what is their diet? A man called Cyril Bennett has spent his life studying the wildlife in rivers. He came up with a simple system for monitoring the invertebrate life, which gives a good indication of how well they and the fish that feed on them are doing. This involves targeting the eight groups that you see here. Below the names, you can see what we're looking for, the nymphs and larvae that turn into the flying insects that you see above except for the shrimp that always stays a shrimp. Whilst they are below or at the water surface, these flies are eaten by fish. We are the Culm Fly Fishing Club because we use imitations of these insects to hopefully attract the fish.
This slide shows how a net is used to catch what is in the river. The bed is kicked, it's more like scraped with the heel really, and the invertebrates in the riverbed are caught in the net. Sometimes we catch other animals such as crayfish or small fish. The big ones always get away. The contents of the net are placed in a tray so that we can see what we've got. Each group can then be identified, counted and recorded. So what do the results tell us? This simple map shows the River Kelm above Colompton. The green length is where the fishing club fishes and the red dots are the survey sites. You can see that there are 10 sites shown here and each site is surveyed three times a year in spring, autumn and winter. I'm just going to show you the most recent results from three of these sites, above Hemioc, below Comstock and on a major tributary that joins the Culm at Colompton. Starting on the right, above Hemioc, we can see that all the groups are present and in significant numbers in most cases. Moving downstream to below Comstock, three groups are totally absent and numbers are much reduced. These sites are only five kilometres or about three miles apart. Finally, look at the Colompton site results. Just two olives, normally the most common group, but an extraordinary number of shrimp. I didn't count each one, but there could just as easily have been 4,000. Clearly something isn't right here. This slide shows the same Riverfly results, but with the CSI phosphate test also shown. We've only just started testing for phosphates, but already the results are helping us to understand what is happening. And finally, wouldn't it be good if we could return to the days not that long ago when the River Colm held four pound trout in the water where they belong and not just in a case? Thank you. Excellent. OK. So I, I'm aware I'm aware that we're barraging you with huge amounts of information here. Um, obviously, as it's been said in the chat, we will make all of the, rec the recording and the recordings of the presentations available to you, so you can watch them back if you've missed anything, um, or indeed if you um, you know reach saturation in terms of information overload. But um, we're, we're getting well through this um, agenda now, and actually we've got two probably um, of the most in interesting, he says, um, certainly to me. Um, uh, subjects coming up next. We've got a section on wildlife, which is uh, really interesting, um, and and then one on heritage, which obviously in the Colm catchment is of great importance. So, um, so bear with us. Um, uh, keep keep going. Um, hopefully, you're all comfortable and um, and uh, enjoying the presentations. Um, so, without further ado, we'll move on to the section on wildlife. And bear with me. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Full start, full start. Don't panic. That's the first one we've had. Um, so Simon McHugh uh, works for the Environment Agency and he's going to give an overview on wildlife in relation to the to the coal. And I will now actually start his presentation properly. Hello. My name's Simon McHugh and I'm a biodiversity officer with the Environment Agency. And today I've got a few minutes to talk to you about some of the great things you can find along the River Cole and about some of the not so great things you might find too. The geology and the historic management of the river has created an extremely diverse system with braided channels, shallows and pools, with habitats and niches for a great variety of species in its waters along its banks. And today I'm going to take you on a couple of virtual walks along the river to see what's there in terms of wildlife and habitats and to take a look at some of the issues that the river faces today. Our first outing starts with us walking through a peaceful wooded river corridor with the gentle sounds of the river and birdsong filling our ears. As we tiptoe amongst the bluebells or splash through the reeds and rushes that fringe the river you might catch sight of a kingfisher fly past, carrying a small fish. 
or we might see a crowd of swallows and sand martins swooping to catch mayflies rising from the water. There might be a family of otters so busy playing in the beds of water crows for, that they don't even notice that we're here. We might see a salmon leaping over one of the many weirs or swimming up one of the fish passes that have been built in the river since the 1980s. If we've got our Polaroid glasses on, maybe we'll even see salmon and lamprey spawning in the clean gravels in the river bay. And when the evening comes, we might see and even hear the bats foraging amongst the trees and across the water as we make our way home. All in all, we've had a lovely day out, and it's time to put up our feet and have an well-earned rest. But this is an exceptionally good day, of course, and we don't always have good days on the car. So we set off again, and our next outing finds us walking ankle-deep in mud along cattle poach banks stripped of vegetation by grazing livestock. We'll walk along bare field edges with no trees or natural bankside habitats to be seen. We might see a digger in the river scraping the gravels from the bed to surface nearby tracks. And along long reaches of gravels smothered with silt and covered in blankets of algae thriving in the high nutrient levels of the water. Maybe we're confronted by fish gasping for oxygen after an accidental discharge of pollutants from one of the many industrial units in the valley, or from a farm slurry spill. It could even be the result of very low flows and high water temperatures that we're experiencing more and more in our changing climate. We might find our path blocked by a wall of Himalayan balsam and Germany, Japanese knotweed. And there might be an, an American mink tangling with a duckling or a swan. The calm as it is, is far from perfect in terms of naturalness. And what's here to enjoy now is likely only a fraction of what could be here. There are people working hard to improve things but they're facing lots of physical, financial and behavioural challenges. However, there is a base here that can be built on and things can improve if we can find the energy and enthusiasm to do something about it. And the Connecting the Calm project is a great opportunity to help move things forward. Thank you for listening. Okay, powerful stuff there. Um, from Simon. Um, hopefully that's got your brains uh, ticking over. Um, and while they do, I will move on to the next talk. Okay, so the next talk is, following on from that, is uh, from Nikki Green who's an expert on crayfish. Um, and there's been a lot of work done on the River Colm looking at crayfish. Um, and she's got a talk for us um, about some of the work, that work that's been done. So without further ado, I'll introduce Nikki. Our native white clawed crayfish used to be widespread across England and Wales but have been in severe decline since the 1970s and at least 80% of the original populations have been wiped out. The main cause of this is the introduction of signal crayfish in the 1970s and 80s. They carry a disease called crayfish plague which is fatal to white clawed crayfish and also outcompete and predate their smaller and less aggressive cousins. In Devon, we have just two white clawed crayfish populations left, and one of those is our, on our own River Culm in the Blackdown Hills. Believed to have died out in the 1980s, we rediscovered them at Culmstock Bridge in 2005. Surveys since then have found white claws between Culmstock and Hemioc along the Culm, but also a population of signal crayfish spreading up and downstream from Whitehall. 
The voracious signal crayfish can reduce populations of other river wildlife such as invertebrates and fish and their burrowing activities cause siltation and riverbank erosion. In 2018, the AOMB was lucky enough to get Heritage Lottery funding for the Calm Community Crayfish Project. As well as raising awareness of our special crayfish amongst the local community, we organised a comprehensive survey of the Calm catchment. With the help of some amazing volunteers, we surveyed the Calm from Uffcolm nearly to its source, plus two tributaries, the Madford and Bolland rivers, and several pond sites. We found that white claws are present from Hemiok all the way down to Five Fords near Uffcolm. But signal crayfish are present in the Madford and Bolland rivers and downstream of our white claws at Earthcoal. Even worse, the crayfish in the Madford River tested positive for crayfish plague, which could easily spread to our white claws downstream. Discovering that our native crayfish are in an even more precarious position than we thought, the AOMB started to look for ways of helping our special Cull residents. In 2019, we teamed up with Paint and Zoo, who set up a facility to house and breathe captive bred Cull white claws. Descendants of animals are collected in 2015 and 2016 for the Bristol Zoo Breeding Programme and some of our regular volunteers located some potential ARC sites. Safe places where we can release and nurture captive bred crayfish and carry out initial tests and surveys. In the meantime, Paint and Zoo secured funding for a two-year Devon ARC site project which means we can develop that work and extend it to the other Devon white claw populations on the Creedy Yo River near Crediton. Sadly, due to COVID-19, we are unable to make a start this year, but things are back on track for 2021. Despite COVID, we have managed to set out, get out cray fishing this year, surveying the Sheldon Stream, a tributary running northwards to enter the Culm at Five Fords. It's great to see so many of our brilliant volunteers from 2018, and I think some of them may have caught the crayfish bug. We, sur we survey using a combination of searching under rocks, kick sampling, and setting artificial refuge traps which mimic the natural place, places a crayfish would hide. Unfortunately, we haven't found any white claws and have found yet another signal crayfish population, making the need for arc sites even more pressing. As this year's crayfishing season comes to a close, we will look back on a challenging but nonetheless productive and rewarding year. So that's a, that is an incredibly inspirational project that's ongoing. Um, and yeah, fantastic work. Um, and from that, I segue to something equally as inspirational, um, but potentially that hasn't yet come to the calm. Um, and that is that Ed Parr Ferris from Devon Wildlife Trust is going to talk to us uh, live, uh, I believe, about <laughs> be about beavers uh, in Devon. Um, obviously, they're 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 near the calm, and Ed's probably going to tell us exciting ideas and inspirational opportunities that lie ahead. You go, go, thanks go ahead. thanks nick yeah i hope my internet holds up for this uh i'll just share my screen now hopefully okay people can see my screen Yeah, put it on if you put it on slide. Dominic right. or Nick, can you just let me know that you can see it? Yeah, we can see the we can see PowerPoint. Um, if you just put it on slideshow, it should should be all right. Obviously, yeah, perfect. Great. Uh, so I'll get started. Um, so I'm Ed Parferis. I'm conservation manager at Devon Wildlife Trust, um, and I work with the other guys on the uh, River Otter Beaver Trial and our other beaver projects. Um, so I'm going to talk. Uh, today just about uh, beavers, the benefits that they bring and the challenges that they bring about our river otter beaver trial and some of the learning we've got from, from working with beavers over a number of years um, and then the, the government decision and what's next for beavers in England and particularly at the very end about opportunities on the culm. Um, we're looking at um, Eurasian beaver here. Um, they're a, a species that are native to the UK and to Devon. Uh, they were hunted to extinction in Britain about 400 years ago. Uh, they're large, they're about one metre long, with it not including their tail, and weigh about 20 kilos. They're entirely herbivorous rodents, and they mainly are nocturnal and semi-aquatic. Um, the benefits of beavers can be seen through seeing what a beaver does to its landscape. Um, these maps are from our Incas in 11, starting with this very simple stream. Um, of, uh, of the site 
and seeing what it did, what they beavers did to it. So over the years, they they dammed and canaled the entire site, creating a network of diverse habitats that now store over uh, one million litres of water in this small three hectare site. Water storage does several things. Um, it reduces peak flows that people were mentioning earlier on, if you can see the graph there, head of where the water goes out of the site. Um, and it also increases the base flows at, um, at, at drier times. The slowing down of the water through the system also means that the sediment and all the pollutants attached to that sediment is dropped. So it actually produces cleaner water. Um, this sort of melee of, of, uh, of biodiversity that's going on in, in the site also means that there's great opportunities for storing carbon in sites where beavers are involved um, so with the plant growth, but also the sediment that's captured there. Uh, in terms of biodiversity, things increase more samples frog spawn. Um, in 2011, the site hosted, West Devon hosted just 10 frog spawn clumps by 27. So moving back to the River Otter then. Um, first signs of beavers on the river were, were seen uh, about 2007, 2008. And in 2014, footage of beaver kits was shown um, demonstrating that they were breeding and Natural England and DEFRA therefore needed to take into action their, their a policy of removing the beavers. Uh, a local campaign um, uh, demanded that they wanted that their beavers to stay and Devon Wildlife Trust then went and got a license um, to reintroduce the beavers after testing for, for health and light um, and for a five-year trial to study the impact of beavers in a lowland landscape. Now I've mentioned quite a few of the benefits of beavers, but obviously um, they also come with a whole load of challenges. And this was something that the trial looked at. They, they, they fell trees, both small, uh, mostly small, but also some large. Uh, they flood land, like I've already said, but they, they do that in some, not always in the places you want it to be. Um, and obviously that creates quite a challenge and they can damage infrastructure and crops, like here, this maize crop on the bottom right. So the trials monitored all these impacts, um, developing methods uh, for managing these where necessary, often borrowed from places like Bavaria, where they're experienced in managing beavers. Um, a key element is working with landowners um, and looking at ways that future schemes that work with farmers and the likes can um, um, help support landowners to mitigate uh, the, the impact of beavers and make space for beavers. Here's just some examples of things we've been trialing. So the trial very much demonstrated that while these challenges are real, they can be managed and the benefits considerably outweigh the challenges. And the government agreed on, um, uh, and on 6th of August this year, announced that the beavers could stay and also critically they could expand to other areas. And that's where we come to places like the Culm. So uh, this presents uh, new opportunities for neighbouring catchments like the Culm. Uh, which are likely to be populated next. So the River Culm is immediately adjacent on the southeast of, of, the, um, of the River Culm and actually has multiple sites where the, where the two uh, watercourses come very close to each other. Um, so someone like the Culm could start to see some of the benefits that beavers are likely to spread to the Culm, um, but also some of the challenges will need to be managed. Um, one example will be where the Culm Garden Village um, is being built and developed. Uh, they'll have to build in beavers to that development. So giving them the space to protect infrastructure uh, and to take advantage of those benefits. So stepping back from the watercourses, um, potentially moving infrastructure away from watercourses uh, and, and also um, using things like uh, clear span bridges instead of culverts. In terms of volunteering, uh, we're keen to, to look at opportunities like those that are carried out in Bavaria, where um, uh, volunteers play a, a detailed role in both the monitoring of beavers uh, on watercourses with beavers, but also uh, a part in the management of that. Now, we were awaiting government decision on uh, the future of beavers uh, in terms of management going forwards, um, but we know that they are allowed to spread into the calm, so we'll be looking at opportunities going forwards. And we've, we're already exploring that with the Blackdown Hills AOMB uh, and the Connecting the Calm team. I think the last thing I just wanted to advocate was that um, I think the role of beavers is inspirational for people. Um, they are not just a sort of functional item in, the, in our landscape that help us and help other wildlife. They certainly do that. But I think 
one of the things that they do is certainly uh, kickstart interest in wildlife um, as a part of our landscape and a living, active uh, and changing part of our landscape. Uh, and they're also quite fun to watch here, uh, struggling with a big stick to build a dam. OK, I'll leave it there. Thanks very much. Brilliant. Thanks, Ed. Uh, again, another one who never disappoints. Um, <laughs> so um, I just wanted to uh, raise the issue. Um, uh, we are very aware that it is now half past six. <coughs> now, we still have two short talks left. Um, so I, I'm hoping that you'll be able to bear with us for a bit longer just to hear these last two talks, which are about heritage. Um, uh, if you do have to go, of course, that's absolutely fine. Um, I was just wondering whether or not we should run the exit poll. Yeah, the two, two more talks, one from Mel Kroll about landscape and one from Anthony Firth um, from Fjorda about heritage, which I think both promise to be really interesting. So hopefully yeah, people can stick around um, just for another, yeah. at least another 10 minutes or so. Yeah, so let's so let's press on. I think that the numbers have, have remained good, and everyone seems interested. And the chat has got is on fire. Um, particularly, um, I've seen I've seen glimpses of comments about water vaults, which I think is hugely interesting, um, and and other other com comments and questions as well. So um, now these last two speakers are both live. So um, I would like therefore to invite uh, Mel Kroll, who's a landscape officer for, at Devon County Council, who's going to give a short presentation about landscape character. Mel, are you there? Yes. Hello, everybody. Thanks, Nick. Um, yeah, my name's Melanie Kroll. I'm the landscape officer for Devon County Council, and I'm going to attempt to share my screen now. Can you see that? Not, not yet. Not yet, no. Yeah, you're fine at my end, John Berry. Oh. We can <laughs> oh. <laughs> we can see we can see your we can see your head when you're talking, Mel, but we can't see a screen yet. Yeah, okay. Ah. Yeah. That's it. That's got it. That's it, yeah. yeah. Oh good. Put it on Thank presentation you. mode and you're away. Great. Okay, so I'm going to tell you about, um, uh, sorry, I need to get rid of that. Um, I'm going to tell you about um, the landscape character of the Colm catchment area um, with reference to landscape character assessments, which some of you may have heard of. Um, I'm going to spend my six minutes talking to you uh, within rapid mode because I've got lots of slides, but I thought it'd be first good to share with you the legal definition of what landscape is. And so here it is, an area as perceived by people whose character is a result of action and interaction of natural and or human factors. And it covers natural, rural, urban, peri-urban areas, includes land, in, inland waters and marine areas. So this wheel, landscape wheel, kind of graphically shows that definition. So landscape is essentially the sum of the parts. So we've talked about or we've heard about natural aspects of the landscape, um, soils, geology, water, wildlife, climate. Um, so this concept brings in the cultural and heritage aspects, not only those things, but also how people perceive all that, some of the parts, as I say. So what are landscape character assessments? Well, basically they're a tool that allows us to do just that, to, um, to, to describe variations in the character of an area and pull everything together, the natural, the cultural, and the perceptual aspects of a place. So it provides a uniting framework for all of that. And this map is a snapshot of what we have in Devon, and I'll delve more into that and how it relates to the Colm landscape. So you can make out the, the shape of the county, hopefully. So it's a new map of Devon, which I'll explain. It provides a, a written descriptions tied to that map. Each area has a script description that 
that shows how the landscapes evolved over a time through millions of years and thousands of years, how what it is at the moment and how it's going to change in the future or could do. Um, it highlights what the special qualities of a place are, what the valued, valued attributes are that people value, what makes it distinctive and special. And tied to that, um, it, it identifies guidelines to help us manage landscape change, so important. Um, and it's used in planning and land, man, land management decisions. Um, it particularly supports the AONB management plans, areas of that outstanding natural beauty. And that's the case for the Black Down Hills and the East Devon AONB. And it's actually um, provides key evidence to support um, local plans, how landscape varies in character. So in Devon, we have lots of information. Uh, we have three layers of information, in fact, that form a nested hierarchy, whereby one layer provides a finer grain of detail than the next. So this slide just shows how that relates to Heartland Peninsula in North Devon. Um, so at the top, you've got national character areas. Those divide the country into areas recognisable at a national scale. Then you have Devon character areas, which further divides those. And then at the bottom, you have landscape character types, which provide a finer grain of detail. So very quickly, that's what you have for the national character areas. It spans uh, two, the, the project area spans the Devon Redlands and Blackdown Hills. I'm not going into detail on those. You can find out more information on the gov.uk website. Then you've got the landscape character assessment for Devon, which further subdivides that into geographically unique character areas. And we've got a number of those within the project area. They all have written profiles associated with them, which I'll come back to later. And finally, the landscape character types, which is the main focus, I think, for this project uh, in terms of the usefulness of them. So, um, so landscape character types are generic types of landscape. So things that occur anywhere in Devon, such as, for example, if you look at the map, you can see this dark blue vein, which corresponds to really the, the Colm and its floodplain. So that's characterized as viva, um, that's characterized as sparsely settled farmed valley floors. And you'll see to the left, the X Valley is also similarly characterised as that, and also the Clist to the southeast. So those, those, these categories can, can occur anywhere in Devon. And we've got 12 categories in the project area, and I'll just very quickly go through those uh, for you. So in the, in the east area, we've got the uplands of the Blackdown Hills. So at the very top, we've got the beige areas, which are open inland planned plateaus that's referred to as 1A and then edging those is the uh, wooded steep wooded scarp slopes and we heard about the spring line mires and settlements that characterise that area of the Black Downs. Mel you've got 30, 30 seconds left. Oh right okay well I, I think I will leave you to explore that on your own um, but basically it's hopefully a way of, of interpreting the landscape in a way that people can understand. Um, and the contents of each profile that goes with each character area or type includes a description of the area, key characteristics, special qualities, both natural, historic and perceptual, forces for change and guidelines to protect, manage and plan. And that's what I want to focus on at the very last bit. Uh, so it's bringing it all together and relating it to a place. So these are examples of some guidelines that deliver multiple benefits. This is from the Mid Devon LCA, which is now almost 10 years old and it needs updating, but it does provide a useful framework to help guide changes in the landscape. So if you, if you want to do any interventions in the landscape, if you're a land owner, land manager, even if you've got a garden, it's things to think about what you can do in your particular place. You can find the information on Devon County Council's website via the DCC Environment Viewer. Please explore that if you have a chance. It's got loads of environmental information on all these topics. Um, and also the LCA information is in the Mid Devon and East Devon District Council websites, usually under local plan evidence base. 
Um, I won't go to that because we've run out of time. So thank you very much. And um, you can find out a lot more about this on, on, on Devon County Council website. So thank you very much. Thanks, Mel. That's absolutely fantastic. And I should, would just reiterate that um, the links that are in Mel's presentation are, many of them are in the chat um, that Stephen's put there. And the landscape character documents are hugely interesting and very accessible. So I'd encourage everyone to go and have a look at those. Um, uh, so last but not least, definitely not least, um, we have a, um, we, we a just presentation. Need, um, we just need Mel to, Melanie to stop sharing her screen, please. Oh, yes. Perfect. Um, yeah, so last but not least, we have a presentation on historic environment. So a big element of the Connecting the Coal project has been focusing on the historic environment of the Colm Valley and the whole of the Colm catchment landscape. Um, and suffice to say that it is hugely interesting, as many Devon landscapes are. Um, and so without further ado, Anthony, uh, if, you, if you could... Uh, Give your presentation um, on historic yeah, environment. Certainly. Um, certainly. So hopefully can you see my screen? Absolutely, yes. Perfect. Okay, well, good evening everyone. Um, thank you for hanging in there um, for, for for me at the end. Um, my name's Anthony Firth. I'm from a, a small company called Fjorda Limited, and we're archaeologists uh, who specialize in marine, coastal, and inland waters. Um, we're looking at the history of the coal, uh, the way people have used the river and how they've changed their water course over the centuries. And we're working alongside the Connecting the Coal team, funded and supported by uh, Historic England. So, although the river often seems quite natural, it has in fact been significantly altered uh, on a large scale and, and for a long time. And not just over the last 50 or 100 years, but over many centuries and even millennia. Now, in many cases, those earlier changes have been absorbed back into the landscape, but traces still remain and they still affect how the river performs today. Now, the slide shows Colum John Mill, which dates back to Doomsday and was supplied by a major artificial channel or, or leet. Uh, and the mill and the leets have disappeared from modern maps, but the old water management structures still survive if you, if you know where to look. So why does the history of the river still matter? For several reasons. If we try to apply nature-based solutions to a system that we assume is natural, we might not achieve the, um, the improvements that we want. Um, understanding the history of the catchment can help identify the cause of some of our problems today. And the history of the catchment might help us find some solutions too. And seeing how people lived with the river in the past can help us change how we live now so that we're better able to live with the river in the future. So what are we doing? We've made a map of all the different places where people have used or changed the river, the river column and tributaries to history. Our map covers the whole catchment and I hope you can see that it's made up of lots of little shapes on that slightly zoomed in section on the right. We've made our map using many different sources of information. Together with various archeological records, we've used tithe maps from the 1840s before the railway, um, old Ordnance Survey maps, aerial photographs from just after the Second World War, and LIDAR, which uses a laser to scan the ground from the air, and that picks up all the humps and bumps, which we can then interpret. We've combined all this information into a new map of old things which we can feed into the work being carried out by connecting the coal. For example, this information can help in designing nature-based solutions that work with the grain of the historic landscape. And it also provides intriguing background detail that can be shared when talking about the river with local communities to find ways that they can become involved in their local river heritage. Now, I hope you've enjoyed this very brief introduction to our work on the historic character of the River Colne. If you're interested in this history of the river or have information to share, please get in touch with the Connecting the Colne team and they'll pass on your details so we can follow up. Many thanks. Fantastic. The prize for the punchiest presentation at the most opportune moment definitely goes to you, Anthony. That was fantastic. Um, so, 
amazingly, uh, hopefully you can appreciate how much we've tried to pack in. It, it, when putting this agenda together was a bit like kids in a sweet shop. Um, we, had, we wanted to pack absolutely everything into it. Um, and, uh, and that's why, that's my excuse for us overrunning slightly. Um, so that is the end of the programme. Um, there are a couple of things left to do, which will only take a few more seconds of your time. Um, one thing that I think we should do now, Dominic, if we could, is, is could, we're going to ask you the same questions um, that we asked you at the start. And we'd just like to very quickly capture your, your scores for those same two questions that we asked before. So, um, so you should see, uh, question one, how aware are you of the impacts that climate change and other pressures are having, will have on the health and natural functions of the River Colm? One, not aware, 10, very aware. Uh, and question two, if you scroll down, you'll find question two, how motivated are you to change your behavior or take actions that will help improve the health and function of the River Colm? One, not motivated at all, 10, more motivated than you can imagine. So plug in your numbers. Actually, I should say for question two, everyone was incredibly motivated already. Um, so I we won't necessarily have, have, have achieved more motivation, uh, but hopefully we've, we've, uh, we'll have achieved something in terms of raising people's awareness. So that's, that's our ambition. 77%, we're nearly up to 80% again, Dominic. So I'll give it a couple more seconds and then we'll, uh, we'll close it and we must endeavor not to remember not to delete the answers as well. Okay, 83%, close it. So very quickly, hopefully you can see the results. Now that the answers to question one, 10 came out top with 33% of people and nine followed closely by nine and eight. Uh, and as before, uh, you are over half of you are maximally, if that's a word, motivated to get involved and uh, ch change your behavior, take action to improve the health and condition and function of the River Colm. So that is truly fantastic. Um, so I wanted to get that done. I appreciate that some of you will need to slip away uh, and and do various other things that you would have done on your on your Thursday evening. Um, I think it's fair to say that we will stay uh, if you do want to stay. If you do have pressing questions, if you do want to um, uh, involve, get involved in a bit of a discussion, then we can probably stick around for a, for a while longer. So please feel free to stay if you if you do want to. But otherwise. Huge thanks to everybody who's joined. Also huge thanks to everybody in the project team who has worked very hard to put this on. Um, and um, yeah, it's been a really fantastic event from our side and, and hopefully you, you got lots from it. And um, hopefully we will work with you again and connect with you again in the future as the project continues. I know, so, can, I, can I just intervene quickly before too many more people go? and just mentioned the blueprint and the connecting the Calm forum. So a lot of the questions and discussion points that are, have been emerging are about how can we take action to address some of these problems? And we're developing this long-term management plan for the catchment, which is also an investment plan. It's, it's designed to trigger funding to come into the catchment to improve things. So um, do get involved in that process. It's, it's a fully open process and it launches on the 18th of November. Have a look at the Connecting the Cone website and there's, uh, you'll, you'll have, there's a preliminary early, early bird registration there, but it's gonna be a, a process that goes on through for a, over a whole week at the end of November um, and gets the whole blueprint concept underway. So yeah, please, please join us in that. And, and uh, I've been reminded to also say, obviously, huge thanks as well for all of the questions and discussion points in the chat, as Dominic mentioned then. Uh, we will circulate all of the outputs from the event, talks, um, the chat, uh, all the links that we've been mentioned, uh, have been mentioned in talks and in the, in the discussion. So, um, so yeah, so huge thanks also for your input on there. And we will follow up with many of you um, who have questions that remain unanswered. So rest assured, we will do everything we can to make sure that all of your questions uh, and concerns potentially are, are answered over the coming weeks and months. So unless Stephen, you want to say anything? Um... Yeah, that's great. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, just to reiterate what Dominic was saying there, that um, you know that this is this is the beginning, not the end. Uh, this is, and as lots of people have mentioned, um, different priorities and um, issues and conflicting priorities and issues as well and opportunities 
and we want to you know, work with you and the people in the, in the catchment um, and different stakeholders and landowners as well to to really make sure that we've got a bright future for the River Colne. So please do get involved in the project and in, especially in the, the forum event that's coming up, uh, as Dominic said, um, next month where you know we'll be yeah looking to build on you know use all the, what we've heard about today as a as a part of a scientific foundation for where we go next um to make sure we've got um yeah resilient catchment and river so yeah thanks very much for everyone for dialing in it's been um yeah great to have so many people online and and leaving questions and um comments so yeah thanks very much to to everyone and especially all the speakers as well